Welcome to another lecture on design and analysis of algorithms. Our topic for today is average case analysis of quicksort. Let us begin by discussing average case analysis. Let us let's suppose that A be an algorithm, Q be the set of input instances of A and let us make it make Q be a function of n. So, Q of n is a set of instances of uh, instances for algorithm A uh, of length n. T sub A of Q is the time taken by A on instance Q. Given this, we can define the average time taken by A on inputs of size n, which we might write down as m sub a of uh, m sub a of n, m could be interpreted as mean for example, and m sub a of n is defined as sum over all instances in this set q of n or sum over all instances of size n of the time taken by those instances divided by the total number of instances. So, this is the usual definition of what we mean by an average. This is not the most popular definition of course. The definition we usually use is the so called worst case measure okay, or the worst case time of an algorithm A on problems of size n is defined as the maximum over all q of this. Okay. The maximum time taken by any input instance of size n is defined as the usual measure or the worst case time. There are several reasons for doing this. Worst case is usually easier to compute than this average. When we talk about the average, in some ways we have to talk about all input instances, whereas often it is easier to deduce what the worst instance is going to be and then we can just worry about that. For many algorithms, most of the inputs behave like the worst input anyway. So, in which case it does not really matter. It does not, it, it is not really necessary to take the average in any case. Very often, maybe perhaps the uh, average case is easy to compute if at all and uh, it might still not be preferable, it might still not be so popular because in practice you do not know which input instances are likely to appear more frequently. If some instances appear more frequently, then in this mean expression, we would have to weight those instances more heavily. Therefore, uh, if we just take the mean, then that is not an indication of what might happen, what might happen in practice. And therefore, again, we do not really focus so much on the average case analysis. Worst case on the other hand might be conservative but at least we know that it is conservative and therefore, we can at least give some guarantees. Our topic for today is quicksort however, where average case analysis turns out to be quite useful and quite interesting. So, let me say a few things about quicksort. Quicksort is a popular sorting algorithm, perhaps the most popular and the most commonly used in practice. It is very fast okay? and it is as I said, it is often the method of choice. The worst case time of quicksort is O of n squared. The average case time on the other hand is O of n log n and we will see this quite soon. So, in some sense the excellent performance in practice okay, might be better explained by the fact that the average case time is O of n log n rather than by focusing on the worst case time. So, let us now take a look at this algorithm. Quicksort is based on a divide and conquer strategy and the algorithm is something like this. Okay. So, as input we take an array x 1 through n, by writing x 1 through n I simply mean that x is an array whose length is n. This is an array in which we have keys, we can think of these keys for the minute as some integers perhaps and our idea and the goal of quicksort is to sort them. That is, let us say that the smallest keys have to come at the beginning and the largest ones have to go towards the end. Okay. We begin quicksort by looking at the base case first. So, the base case just checks whether this is an element, th this array only has one element. If it only has one element, 
then the array is sorted trivially and therefore, we just return that array. Otherwise, we pick something which we will call a splitter okay, and that splitter is just chosen to be the first element of this x. The first key is the splitter. Then we build three lists. A list which we will call small is going to be a list which contains all elements of x which are smaller than the splitter. A list which we will call equal which will contain all elements of x which are equal to x 1 and so we begin by putting x 1 into equal. Okay. I should perhaps have said list over here, but will not we have not been worrying we have not been very careful about this and we will not be very careful about this throughout the course. So, we will so I will just let I will just tell you that we have just made equal be a single list uh, a list with a single element. And we will also construct a list which we will call large and large will in uh, uh, will contain all the elements of x which are larger than x 1. So, right now it has been initialized to null and small has also been initialized to null. This loop is simply going to build up the lists as we just described. Okay. So, first step if so for every element other than the first okay, we check whether it is whether it is smaller than splitter in which case we add that element to small. If it is equal to splitter then we uh, add it to equal if it is greater than splitter we add it to large. So, at the end of this loop all the elements have been put into the proper lists. So, now it is simply a matter of recursion. So, small is a list which contained all small elements. So, we call q sort or quick sort on this list. So, as a result we will get these elements sorted. Now, these elements are all guaranteed to be smaller than the elements in the list equal and those in turn are guaranteed to be smaller than the list in large, but we do not append large immediately over here we quick sort it. So, as a result we have a long list which is made up by appending three lists, but which in turn is guaranteed to be sorted. So, this is how quick sort works. So, as I said it is a divide and conquer strategy the division part is where the interesting work happens and then there is the conquer part and then the combine part is trivial. Correctness, well correctness is quite obvious you can do an induction on size if you want to prove it formally and I will leave that as an easy exercise. So, now we want to analyze this algorithm. Let me use t of n to denote the time for quick sort on size n input. So, right now I have only written n over here, okay. but I will actually have a specific input in mind just for the minute. Okay. Later on we will worry about average cases or the worst cases or whatever. So, right now let us say that this is for a particular input instance. Okay. So, t of n is the time taken by that particular instance. So, how do we analyze this? Well, usually if we write something like this we try to establish a recurrence. Okay. So, of course, no matter what input instance we feed if it is if it has length only uh, only 1 then the time taken is constant. So, that is what you write down first. Then we need to find out how the recursion happens. So, let us just go back to the algorithm. So, over here the recursion happens by calling quick sort on small and calling quick sort on large and before that we have a loop which runs about n times. So, as a result we have O of n time for the loop and T of large or T of the cardinality of large is the time taken for that instance for, for the uh, uh, for invoking quick sort on the list large and T of small is the time taken for invoking quick sort on the list small. Now, we can analyze this using a recursion tree. So, this was our basic recurrence. So, let us draw a recursion tree corresponding to this. So, we start off with a problem of size n okay. and then as per this recurrence we break the problem into two pieces. One is the small list and the other is the large list. So, this is the small part and this is the large part. ok. 
okay this is a problem of size n this is a small part this is the large part okay if this is a small part this is a large part then we are going to call quicksort recursively on these okay so furthermore this problem will get split this problem will get split of course if the problem is going to get split okay maybe one part one side could be smaller the other side could be larger and so on and maybe in fact one of the lists could be empty in which case of course this whole thing terminates so in general it's going to keep on splitting okay maybe once in a while a list terminates and things will keep on going in this manner okay so what do we know about all this well here is the first observation so if this node has size n then we know that in this node the number of keys which are going to be present is definitely going to be is, is definitely going to be less than n in this node or in fact in this node as well okay so what does that mean so that means that as i go down from here along any branch the size of the instance has to decrease so which means i cannot go down too far so i start the instance of size n it has to decrease therefore that means this height has to be at most n okay that's the first observation the second observation is that if i look at any node okay its children have a certain size but that size adds up to something strictly smaller than this so if i look at the size over here it is n the size over here has to be less than n the size over here in fact has to be smaller than this for these two and for these two it has to be smaller than this so this is also has to be less than n this also has to be less than n and so on so if i look at any level the size of that the sum of the the sizes of the problems at that level have to be at most n okay but now if we go back to our uh, if we go back to our uh, problem uh, our algorithm at each at each uh, inside the body of each invocation we do o of n work or we do work proportional to the size of the problem so which means corresponding to each node over here we are going to do work which is proportional to its problem size so now if i look at the total work done over here it is going to be o of n because it's going to be proportional to this problem size this problem size added up it is going to be proportional to o of n or it is going to be o of n similarly over here also it is going to be o of n at every level it is going to be at most n at most proportional to n so now we have an upper bound on the work because there are n levels at most and at each level the work is o of n and therefore the total work has to be o of n square so this is the upper bound on quicksort now i will leave it as an exercise for you to construct an input instance for which quicksort actually takes time n square okay so this is actually fairly easy let me give you a hint think of a sorted list what if the input instance is already sorted but the key question is that this is the worst time all right but will it be the most time will will it be will it take this long usually or is this some kind of an unusual case okay so if you come back to the recursion tree for to this uh, to this tree then we know that at every level the work is going to be at most n so the real question that we want to ask is will the tree be of a large height or will the tree have a small height because if the tree has a small height then our total work will be less so in fact that's what we will see is going to happen quite frequently so we did the analysis of the worst case so let us ask what the best case is going to be So clearly, the best case is the one in which the tree is as small as possible. If the elements that we are trying to sort are all distinct, then I will claim that the height cannot be smaller than log n. 
Why is that? Well, I am going to leave this as an exercise, but again let me give a hint. So, we said that as we go down the tree height must decrease, okay. but we also said that the sum of the nodes over here, the, the size over here plus the size over here must be smaller than this, but if everything is distinct it will only be one less than this. So, if it is one less than this, then you should be able to argue that it would not decrease too fast either. So, in fact, you should be able to argue that it essentially halves at each step and therefore, the total height will be something like log n. So, what happens in the best case? Okay. So, in the, in the best case it turns out that the total time taken will be O of log n, O of n log n. Okay. And in fact, there is a very simple situation in which the best case will happen, which is, which is this. If the splitter is equal to the median, then the problem size halves and then the height becomes O of log n. Okay. So, if the height is O of log n, the time taken is n log n and that is the best. So, we consider two cases, one case in which the splitter was somewhere in the middle, another case in which the splitter was extreme, okay. the splitter was the smallest element. Okay. Well, that was supposed to be a homework exercise, but suppose we pick the splitter, the splitter happens to be the smallest element, then the list would be split very unevenly. So, let us consider a case which is somewhere in between. Okay. So, in this the splitter is say larger than n over 10 elements in the list and is also smaller than n over 10 elements. So, it could be somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, of course, this is an artificial case, but you can get you can you can imagine that this will have happen frequently enough. Because after all, if I pick an element from a list, okay, it is likely to be somewhere, it is likely to lie somewhere in the middle. So, let us say this happens, let us say that every time I pick a splitter, it satisfies a property like this one. What happens then? Well, let us go back to our recursion tree. So, let us redraw this recursion tree. So, I start with an n node problem, an n key problem. Now, I am going to pick a splitter such that it is, it is larger than n over 10 elements. So, if I, if I consider what is the most uneven distribution, what is the of the two of the sizes? Well, on one side I could get something like a list of n over 10 elements. On this side, I could get a list of say 9 n over 10 elements. So, this is good because this list is going to shrink and it is going to terminate quickly. The height is going to be small over here. This on the other hand might appear to be a problem because here the height has not reduced, the, the size has not reduced. If the size has not reduced, then it will keep on going in this manner and maybe the height of the tree will be large. But what we argued was that the work done in this algorithm is the height of the tree is at most the height of the tree multiplied by n because n is the work at each level. So, let us see what happens. So, in the first level as we have pointed out, the largest problem size will be a 9 n by 10. It could be smaller than that. So, it could be say half half, but that is actually not so bad. That means that the tree height will actually be small. So, this is trying to force the tree height to be large and therefore, it is trying to force quick sort to take large, uh, take long time. So, we are sort of looking at we said that we are looking at uh, neither the best nor the worst cases, but we are sort of erring on the side of the worst within this region. Okay. So, in the first level the problem largest problem size uh, is 9, 9 n by 10, what happens next? Again we are we assume that uh, the problem will split in the ratio 1 is to 9, uh, 1 is to 9. So, this will become say something like n by 100 and 9 n by 100. Okay. This will become something like 9 n by uh, 100 and 81 n by 100. So, as you can see this rightmost branch will keep on uh, keep on having the largest size. Okay. So, what will happen? So, at each in each step the size of the largest problem drops down by a factor 9 by 10. 
and therefore, we can conclude that in log of n to the base 10 by 9, the problem size will even on this rightmost branch will drop down to 1. And even to do that, I will take time, I will take log of n to the base 10 by 9 levels. So, this is good news in the sense that even when I am looking at a split which is lopsided, the number of levels, the, the, the height of the tree is still going to be about log. Well, it is going to be log not to the base 2, but to the base 10 by 9. And let me just remind you that log of n to the base 10 by 9 is simply equal to log of n to the base 2 divided by log of 10 by 9 to the base 2. So, this is still only a constant and therefore, this is still O of log n. So, the height even in this case is O of log n, the height of the tree. The tree height is O of log n and therefore, the total work is n log n. So, even in this middle case, we have seen that the total work is about n log n. So, that is sort of the first intuition as to why quick sort should work, quick, short, quick sort maybe works well in practice. Because unless the splitter comes from is this too large or too small, the two sub problems that we create will be reasonably balanced, okay, not too lopsided. And if they are not too lopsided, then the height of the tree, the height of the recursion tree will not be too large. Too large. Next, we are going to actually do sort of a very systematic analysis of the average time taken by Pixar. We are going to do this in two ways. In one way, we are going to derive a recurrence and we are not, we will not really solve the recurrence, but I will indicate to you how that recurrence could be solved. And it will turn out that the solution of the recurrence is n log n. And then I will indicate a somewhat more elegant way using which we can also derive n log n. Okay, so, when I talk about average case, I have to define what are the possible inputs. So, in this case, I am going to assume that for this per, uh, particular analysis, I am going to assume first of all that all the inputs are distinct. All the input, the, the numbers, the elements, the keys which are given to us are all distinct. And if they are all distinct, I might as well assume that they are integers 1 through n for each of the n keys. But of course, they will not, not be given to me as 1 through n, but they will be given to me as some permutation of 1 through n. So, now I have, now I will state exactly what my allowed inputs are. So, my allowed inputs are any possible permutation of the integers 1 through n. So, there are n factorial possible permutations and there are that many different input instances for my, for my algorithm. So, my question will be, what is the average time taken by my algorithm? over all these input instances or over all these permutations. And of course, I would like it expressed as a function of n. So, now I am going to express, I am going to look at our analysis and I am going to figure out how we can uh, estimate this. So, although I have been talking about different, uh, about taking averages, I can also think of this in terms of probabilities. So, I can think of this as follows. So, I have been given a set of input instances. I have, I have constructed a set of input instances and I am picking one of those instances at random. And I am doing this giving equal probability to every input instance. So, there are n factorial instances possible. Each one has equal probability or in other words, each one has probability 1 over n factorial. So, I am picking one of those. And I could also be asking, under this choice, what is the expected time for that, for the, for the instance that I pick? Which is of course, the same thing as asking, what is the time taken? What is the average of all the times? So, now this average can be estimated by grouping 
the instances into separate groups and then calculating the average within each group okay, and then multiplying by essentially by the size of the group or by probability of picking that group. So, here is how we are going to do it. So, in the first step of the algorithm, we pick a splitter. There are n keys and the keys are going to be numbers in the, in the range 1 through n. So, there is going to be some probability that the splitter is going to be one of those keys, uh, to be any one of those keys. So, in fact, let us assume that we always pick as splitter the first element, which is in fact what the algorithm did. So, in that case, the question is, so we are splitting our, all our input instances into those permutations first, in which the splitter, in which i appears in the first place. And within that group, we are taking the average time. So, let me draw this picture out here. So, here is our set of input instances. So, I am breaking it into pieces. So, these are input instances which begin with 1. That is, they have 1 in the first place. These are input instances which begin with 2. These are input instances which begin with 3 and somewhere over here are input instances which begin with i and of course, at the end there are input instances which begin with n. Okay. So, I am going to pick a group and then I am going to pick an element from it okay. or I can ask what is the average time taken for this group and if all these groups are identical okay, then I can just take this average okay, or I will have to weight it with the size of this group. So, that is exactly what I have done over here. Okay. So, I have taken the average time for this group, which is what is written over here, average time given that splitter is equal to i. But given that splitter is equal to i is the same thing as saying that the first element of that list is i. So, I am in this, re I am in this region of my input space. Okay. And since I want the average over the entire space, I just want to, I will just multiply it by the probability that the splitter is equal to i or the fraction of the fraction which indicates how many instances are there in this group as compared to the entire group. So, this is what I get. Now, what is the average time given that the splitter is i? Well, if we go back to our algorithm here here. So, I pick a splitter over here, then I am going to have this loop anyway. right? So, if I am solving a problem of size n, I will do n work in any case and then I will have I will have my uh, uh, input split into two lists or three lists, but only two of which will be interesting. So, average time given splitter i is going to be O of n for that loop to take, loop to do its work plus the average time for sorting the small set. Okay. But what is the small set? It is the permutation of elements of, of integers 1 through i minus 1 and the average time for sorting permutation of the elements i plus 1 through n because that is what quicksort does. It splits into groups, it's, it sorts the first group, takes the equal elements in which case, uh, in this case there is only one equal element which is i, sorts the last group and then concatenates them together. So, so in addition to sorting the time we will require is, is O of n. Okay. So, we might require O of n time also for concatenation. But in any case, we have written O without actually mentioning the constant and therefore, this is fine. Okay. Or we might have a clever data structure in which case we do not need this O of n time, but in any case we need the O of n time for the loop. So, this is perfectly fine. So, now we have the average time for sorting permutation of 1 through i minus 1 and then the average time for sorting permutation of i plus 1 through n. Here is the important part. So, the first time we picked the splitter to be i and then we constructed this group. 
but the key observation has to be that the numbers the order in which these numbers will appear okay, is not going to be particularly biased. So, we know that within the group that we selected i is going to appear as the first element, but since we were dealing with all possible permutations the other elements would appear equally likely in the first space in this group or in the second space in this group or in the third space in this group. So, this group will have all possible permutations of 1 through i minus 1 as well. So, if it has all possible permutations of 1 through i minus 1, then the time average time for sorting it will be t of i or rather t of i minus 1. Okay. It does not really matter t of i over here. Okay. The time over here is going to be i plus 1 through n or it is going to be t of n minus i. Okay. So, I think, so what do we get from this? Well, this expression has to be put in over here and as a result we get something like this. T of n is equal to sum over i of this probability that the splitter is i. There are n choices for i and since we are considering all possible permutations, everyone is equally likely to appear in the first place and therefore, the probability that i appears in the first place is just 1 over n. So, this is 1 over n and this we just established is this and that is what I have written down over here. I just remarked that this should have been i minus 1 and that is what I have put in over here. Now, this recurrence can actually be solved it is a little bit tedious algebraically, but you can certainly solve it by, by induction since I am telling you that in fact, the solution is n log n. So, that will establish that the average case time of quick sort is, uh, is t of n log uh, is uh, o of n log n. Okay. Now, we are going to do we are going to consider an alternate method for solving this. Okay. So, this is going to be much more direct we are not going to be writing recurrences we are going to just do some interesting counting. So, here we will focus on the comparisons performed by the algorithm. Okay. So, after all the important operation in all of this is comparisons. Okay. So, if you go back to our loop let us just take a look at that. We did other work as well say we added elements into a list, but corresponding to every such operation there is a comparison operation going on as well. So, certainly if we bound the number of comparisons then that will give us a good indication of the time taken by the entire algorithm. So, that is exactly what we are going to do. So, we are going to estimate what is the number of comparisons performed by the algorithm on the average and we will show that that is going to be something like O of n log n. Well, let us first determine what is the maximum number of comparisons possible. So, the maximum number clearly is n into n minus 1 upon 2. This is if every key is compared with every other key. And of course, if the input is the worst case input, then something like this actually happens. But this will not, this will, okay. So, but if the input is some permutation, then every key will not get compared with every key. So, just to see clearly what is going on, I am just going to describe a table which shows what happens for different input instances. So, a table this table will have rows and there will be a row corresponding to every possible comparison. So, our keys are integers in the range 1 through n and for every i and j we will have a row. Okay, so, I compare j that will be the label of that row and in that row we will have information about whether i and j are compared in every possible input instance and in fact, the columns will be the input instances. Okay. So, the entries are going to be indexed by two uh, indices one is i colon j well this itself is a complicated index and the other is this permutation p. 
So, here for example, is a table. Of course, I have just made up the entries in this just to tell you what this table might look like. So, the rows are labeled i comma j. So, starting with one column two, uh, one compare two, uh, one compare three and so on to n minus one compare n. Okay. So, during the execution, whether or not one is compared to two, when permutation one is input is going to be written out here. So, we have left a blank over here and that just says that no, that will not be compared. Okay, just an example. On the other hand, 1 and 3 will, com will be compared when permutation 1 is the input. Similarly, if permutation 2 is the input, then 1 and 2 will get compared, 1 and 3 will get compared and maybe some other things will also get compared. Okay. Similarly, there will be other permutations for which this will be the pattern of comparisons, this will be the and so on. So, there are n factorial possible input permutations. So, we have n factorial possible columns and for each possible comparison we have a row and their intersection says whether that comparison actually happens in the corresponding execution. The key question is are there many t cells in this or are most of the cells blank? What we really want to know is what fraction of the cells in a column are marked or what is the average number of cells which are marked in a, in a given column. We are not going to answer this question directly. Okay, we will begin by asking what is the fraction of cells which are marked in any row and interestingly that will tell us something about what happens in columns as well. So, if I go to a particular row of this table or the row which has been labeled i colon j, the question that I am asking is, is i going to be compared with j in the first permutation or in the first input instance or in the second input instance, in the third input instance and so on. So, here is the key observation. For i to be compared with j, either i or j must be chosen as a splitter before one of the elements in between that is elements i plus j or j minus 1 gets splitter. So, let me explain this a little bit. So, here is i, here is j and there are some elements in between. Well, I know i plus 1, i plus 2 all the way till j minus 1. So, these are the elements that I am considering. Of course, they will not appear in my input instance in this order. They will be in my input instance, they will be scrambled up. Okay, but I am just thinking of them as sitting in, an, sitting in a line. Now, suppose some element over here gets picked up as a splitter, what happens? If this element is picked as a splitter, then this element is compared with everything else. If everything else is compared with it, then this i will get put in the small list. Okay? So, i will go into the small list. j on the other hand will get put in the large list. But remember that once an element goes into this list and another element goes into the into another list, then there is no question of comparing them subsequently. So, if any of the elements in between over here get picked as splitters before any of these two elements get picked, then we know for sure that these elements will go into separate lists and therefore, they will not be compared. On the other hand, before these elements have been picked, suppose i gets chosen, what happens then? Well, then i is going to be compared with everything larger than it or certainly everything which has not been found, which has been, the, which is in the correct, in the current list. But if nothing in this has been selected as a splitter, then this had better be in the current list and therefore, j will get compared with i and vice versa. If j gets picked first, then i will get compared because j will get compared with everything over here. So, which means 
that these two elements must get picked as splitters before these before these inner elements are picked. So, what then is the probability of that happening? So, I claim that the probability of i or j being chosen before i plus 1 or i plus uh, before elements i plus 1 through uh, j minus 1 okay, is in fact 2 minus 2 upon j minus i plus 1. Why is that? So, here is i, here is j. So, how many elements are these in total? So, these are j minus i plus 1 elements and out of these the comparison happens only if this is picked or this is picked. So, there are two cases which are good out of j minus i plus 1 cases and therefore, that is the probability. So, now actually things are very very simple. So, the fact that i or j is the probability that i or j is chosen before i plus 1 or i, minus, uh, I plus 1 through j minus 1 is this just tells us something very simple. It tells us that the fraction of t's in this row is just this because that is what the probability is right. We are going to pick a row at random and we know that 2 upon j minus i plus 1 fraction of the time we get a t okay, or the comparison happens. So, that means in other words the number of columns, the fraction of the number of columns in which t's appear is just going to be this much. So, what does that tell us? So, it tells us that the total number of t's in the entire table is going to be sum over all the rows of this multiplied by n factorial. Let me explain that a bit slowly. So, from this what can I conclude? I can conclude that in row i colon j contains n factorial times 2 upon j minus i plus 1 t's or t's represent where comparisons happen, whether comparisons happen or not. Okay. But if I want over the entire table, I just have to sum over all possible rows. Okay. So, this is what I have written out here, okay. except that the n factorial has been taken outside because it does not, it is it does not depend on what row I am looking at. Well, this expression can be written out slightly differently. So, all possible labels i j I can now classify as all possible labels in which j is a is a second element and then the first element has to be smaller and therefore, it is sum over i such that i is less than j of this expression. But what is that? So, summation over i of uh, i less than j of this expression, well what is the first term? So, i begins from 1 and so, first term is simply 2 upon j, the next term is 2 upon j minus 1 and so on until 2. Okay. But what is this? So, this is let me write it down again, it is 2 upon j plus 2 upon j minus 1 plus all the way till 2 upon 2 or written differently it is 2 times uh, 1 plus half plus 1 third all the way till 1 upon j. And this we know is simply ln n okay, by treating this sum to an integral, converting it to an integral. Okay. So, this is a good estimate or in fact, this is an upper bound. Okay. So, finally, we have that this whole thing is n factorial times sum over j of O of l n j, but if we are going to multi, if we are going to take the sum over j, what do we get? Well, we get n l n n. So we get n l n n over here. Okay, what is n l n n? Well, we, we uh, n l n n 
So, we have total number of t's in the entire table is n factorial times n ln n. So, what then is the number of t's per column or what is the average number of t's per column? Well, how many columns are there? There are n factorial columns and therefore, we divide this total number by n factorial and then we get O of n ln n. Okay. So, average running time is O of n ln n and why is that? Well, because t's represent the number of comparisons and we said that the average that the time is in fact proportional to the number of comparisons. So, the average running time is going to be O of n ln n, but O of n ln n is simply O of n log n as well. So, here the base was the natural uh, base was e or this was the natural logarithm, here the base is 2, but does not matter logs log of n and ln of n are within a constant factor of each other. So, let me conclude. So, I would just like to say that a similar idea works for selection as well. So, suppose we want to select the rth smallest element, then something like this will also be fine. Thank you.